Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. I'm Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. Today's special guest played Haddonfield Memorial's good nurse, Janet, in the sequel to the original Halloween, Halloween 2. You may also remember her as a scheming, selfish heiress, Melissa, on seven seasons of Falcon Crest. I love horror movies, but soaps are a very close second. Please welcome to the podcast, Anna Alicia. <laughs> Woo! Hi, <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. You know, before we even get into Halloween 2 and everything, I read that you grew up in Mexico City and then while attending college, you performed with a dinner theater company in Texas. Um, what was that experience like? And were you always interested in becoming an actor when you were growing up? Uh, from my understanding and my memory, I was always either dancing or dreaming or creating plays. I was charging five cents at, when I was six for people to come in the backyard behind some sheets and watch a play. And I was succeeding. My sister was, you know, the money taker. So I think it was always, I know it was always in me to create and acting was was part of that. And I was born in Mexico, raised in El Paso, uh, raised in Acapulco until my father passed away when I was six. And then we came to El Paso, Texas, and lived there with my grandmother and my uncle um, until they moved out when I was around nine or ten. And then um, I moved out when I was eighteen to go to college in Boston at Wellesley. And then uh, one summer I came home and I was offered a equity contract at the new local dinner theater where all of these big stars were coming in. And I was asked to play all of the, you know, smaller female roles in those productions. And so I was getting a big paycheck and I just had to leave Wellesley and go to the University of Texas and finish there. And the, there was like, sure, why not? I'd love to, you know, to work professionally. So I did that and uh, got to work with a lot of really interesting people, Bob Denver, um, you know, Gavin McLeod, Dana Andrews. I mean, a lot of, you know, names at the time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty great. That is so cool. I mean, like, I love the story of like a kid, like I think stories from childhood and people who've become creative artists you know just hearing the kind of things they were into you know like the chart doing your own shows and charging money like that is such a cool story um we also saw that then after college you, you know you moved out to los angeles what was it like to, to make that leap from you know doing theater to moving to la and auditioning well i was incredibly blessed because i had a brother who raised me right he was he was 10 years older so he's more like my father and I had a mother and both of them were unbelievably supportive. I had two other siblings, but you know, they, they were not the mother and father kind of duo. These, my brother and my mother um, always really encouraged each of us to follow our dreams, not our security. And I was really blessed being a Latina girl, right? And uh, cause I had a, a, a free ride because of my academics to college. And then I had a free ride to law school. And I could have made, you know, been made to feel horrible about not finishing that. So I actually went to law school while I was acting in Los Angeles because I just didn't know how to really drop that kind of security. Um, and then my brother said to me one day when I was nine months into law school and I was also, you know, doing a film out of town, which was insane. He said, you know, you just need to follow your passion. What is it that you really, really want? Because there'll always be time for something else. And I realized that what I'd always wanted is to create. So that was a huge decision. And uh, I, I didn't sleep for nights because that was so huge to leave law school, right? When you have a full scholarship, it was a big, big deal. I can imagine. Wow. That is so impressive though, that you even were trying to tackle that at the same time, you know, law school and and, and acting and everything. But that's great. I, I mean, support of your family is means everything. So to have a family that supports you and what you're passionate about, that's really, really cool. And then you got cast in Ryan's Hope, which films in New York City. What was that experience like going to the Big Apple? Oh, please. That was the most unbelievable experience. I've been here like five months and I was waitressing and I was teaching and I was doing anything I could. And this was my first 
my first audition. And uh, the head of NBC at the time of casting was uh, a man by the name of Joel Thurm, who actually also just wrote a book, who was an incredibly fascinating, wonderfully supportive person. And he actually gave me his sweater during the audition because I was in jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> so I auditioned with name name actresses and I had nothing to say. They were saying I did a movie with, you know, uh, whatever, Paul Newman. And I'd be hearing these girls. Right. And he just added me to the tail end of the audition just to see what I look like on camera. He really didn't think I was going to get this. I mean, I'd never seen a camera. And so when we were doing the audition, he said, you know, I'm going to ask you to slate and you need to say what you've done. And so I hadn't done anything in Hollywood. So I just said, hi, I'm Annalisa. I'm an actress and I love it. Oh, great. <laughs> love that, that. that was it. And so I did my little you know, camera on camera thing. And sure enough, three or four days later, my agent calls me and he says, you better sit down. And I said, why? And he goes, I, he goes, I thought you told me you were a decent actress. And I said, well, I, I thought I was. I did my school plays. I thought I was okay. And he goes, well, I have to tell you, the casting director just called. And you're you need to be in New York in two days because you got the role. Oh, oh my god, that's the best story ever! Wow, it, it just gets better. So get this. So so I have two days to move out of my Hollywood apartment, right? And so I've got to go get boxes, right? So I drive down to Highland to, to a big box store, and I park my car. It's three o'clock. Park my car. Go up to get the boxes. Come back down, and there's no car. Uh, and I see it being towed away. Now I have a day and a half to pack, right? It's being towed away. So I see a cop going down the street and I wave him down. I go, help me, help me, help me. And he goes, what is it? And I go, I just got this role and I'm going to be a star and I have to be in New York. Can you please take me to go get my car? And the guys just looked at this 20 year old girl and they said, come on in, get inside the car. They drove me down there and they were just, you know, they didn't know what to make of me, right? I was so grateful. I went in there, they got my car back, drove home, packed it up, left it all packed up for my brother so I could catch a plane the next day to be on set on Monday. Oh, oh my God. God, this sounds like a play in itself. Yeah, things, I mean, you going to the, the tow truck doing that sounds like that could be an audition piece. Yes, <laughs> that was a great monologue. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. You know, um, obviously, you know, since we're a horror podcast, we're going to focus on Halloween, too, even though, you know, there's a lot. And we do have some questions about your soap time because Tim especially loves I love soap soaps. operas, love um, especially. But, you know, but um, I guess before we even. Yes. Get, yeah. Growing up, were, were you a fan? of horror films? I mean, were they on your radar? Were you into them? You know, I, it's so funny. I was going to say, oh no. But then I remembered that my uncle, my uncle who was kind of our guardian, he and his girlfriend took us to his house one day and they got his popcorn and my sister and I, and I was like seven and she was like six and they put us in front of the TV and they said, you're going to get to see a really scary movie. And so I sat there and we saw she I think it was called She Woman or She Wolf. I can't remember. <laughs> but it was, I think it was maybe, was it Ursula Andrews? I can't remember who it was. But it was like, you know, she was an animal. She became an animal. And I just was fascinated by the whole thing, right? So that was like my first intro to horror. And then I remembered seeing this film and I can't remember the name of it. And I'm, I'm like desperately looking for it my whole life. You know, I don't know if it was one of the Sinbad movies, but it was... It was this movie and these this guy's climbing up the hill, right? And as he's climbing, he's melting because he's climbing closer and closer to the sun. And it had fantastical things in it, like big, huge flying birds and princesses. And, and I, I, you know, I've always wanted to find it and I've never, never found it. I thought, was it Hercules? Was it Simba? Oh. You know, oh my I know. So I'm still looking for that. If anybody, if, knows, I'm yeah. just going to say listeners out there, if you know what Anna Lisa is talking about, please Let send us, us an email, happy horror time at gmail.com or comment after this, because we would love to find out what this is. That almost sounds like it could be like a Twilight. Yeah, episode. it does sound like a Twilight. Well, it wasn't a Twilight. Song. It was a movie and it might have even been black and white. I mean, it was just but I remember being impressionable and seeing this young man going up the hill and becoming older and older as he goes up the hill and his face is melting. And I thought, wow. And I mean, I, I never forgot that. So if a listener 
gets me the answer, I will I will send him an autograph of whatever he wants of Halloween. Oh, you I heard think, that. Uh, you heard that. That well, is an amazing we, offer. Matt and and I, I feel like I feel like Tim and I are gonna look for that <laughs> because we really want the autograph. Um, <laughs> um so you know, we read that prior to getting the role of Janet in Halloween 2 that you were in Rick Rosenthal's acting class, Rick Rosenthal being the director with Leo Rossi, who plays Bud, Gloria Gifford, who plays Mrs. Alves, and Nancy Stevens, who plays um Marion Chambers. It, that must have been so much fun. What was that acting class like? And I also have to ask: Is it true that Ted Danson and Tom Selleck were in it? Well, they were in a different on in a different night. But I have to tell you, it was one of those classes. I I mean, I came you know when I decided to become an actress. Uh, you know, it was a lot of pressure, right? It was like you know, and I was scared, and even though I was under contract at Universal, it was all a very scary time. I didn't have any confidence. You know, I was only, you know, it was my early, early 20s. And so a friend of mine who I'd met in New York because we lived in the same apartment, who was a director, he said, you should look up Milton Costellis. So I, I did. And I went to the class and I, and I sat in it and I thought, you know, I'm getting a really good vibe here. Really good vibe. So what Milton gave me and I think he gave each one of those people you're talking about, including Rick, including Tom, including uh, Michelle Pfeiffer was in my class. Yeah. I mean, we had some heavy hitters in that class along with all the people you mentioned. What he knew more than anything is he knew who you were, your authentic self. He knew how to break that open uh, so that you could you know, really capitalize on your authentic casting. So when I started in that class, uh, he had some really talented people like Rick and his wife, Nancy, right? They were yes. girl, boyfriend and girlfriend. And so Rick came up to me and said, you know, I'm having this audition. It's my first film. You know, I'd love you to come out and read. So I went out and read. He was in, he, he is still an incredibly generous, creative person uh, and incredibly talented. And both his kids, his daughter is a director. His son is a cinematographer. Brilliant, right? And Nancy, his wife, is brilliant, not just as an actress, but, you know, she's very much into, you know, making a difference socially. She's just a really, it's a powerful family group. So we uh, each auditioned and in front of the producers and we, we got these roles. But what Milton gave, you know, gave me later was I was playing all of these very sweet girls in all of my shows. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me one day and like four months into meeting him and he said, you need to play Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. That is the role. He goes, you're hiding behind this sweet thing. He goes, he goes, but you've got some ancestors there. You got some stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. He goes that you need to tap into. So I did Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. I was never the same. I went to my agent and I turned down a lead in a series because she was a sweet girl. And I said to my agent, I don't want to play those roles. I want to play this type of role. And my agents were so shocked that half of them fired me. Only one believed in me because she was willing to take a chance. The role I turned down was in Flamingo Road. That series lasted another year. The casting director got me this other part after I turned down this reel from her, and that lasted almost eight years. Oh, wow. wow. So, so you made the right decision. That's amazing. And that's a great story. I and mean, like, that was Milton. That was Milton. Costello. Wow. All from that acting class. I, when you were re so I was interested, like, I was going to ask next about the audition process. So, you, so you had met Rick Rosenthal in the class. He asked you to read for it. And did you immediately read for Janet, or had you read for multiple parts in Halloween, too? No, he saw me as Janet, but because remember, I was still playing the sweet girl. The sweet girl, right? yeah. And so yeah. The I was yeah. just one, one. Yeah. Did he tell, did he tell you much about the part or she's just like the sweet girl working at the hospital kind of thing? Did he tell you that drunk Dr. Mixter is constantly forcing you to get coffee? <laughs> you know, he said, um, you know, you, you got this, you know, this is, this is, this is easy for you. You know, he was really supportive and he believed in us because he'd seen us work in class. Yeah. And so he just said, you know, she's a candy striper. You know, she's young, she's opinionated, um, she's a good at two shoes. And I said, oh, I can't relate to that. I went to Catholic school. I don't know anything about that. I wore a uniform for like eight years of my life. Right? <laughs> so um, so he cast me really well because I had to wear a uniform. And I had already been a candy striper in real life. Oh, so wow. <laughs> so that's perfect. 
You know, we also have to watch, we obviously watched the special features on the Halloween 2 DVD, of course, because we're that big of fans. And you mentioned in the special features that you had a crush at the time on Leo Rossi. Can you tell us a little about that? And was he a heartbreaker back then? (laughs) You know, who wouldn't have a crush on Leo Rossi? He, He was, you know, especially in class. Because he was like this Italian guy from the East Coast, yeah. right? Who kind of just said it the way you know it was, and he just kind of you know let it like you know he was out there with his own you know masculinity and his humor and his you know gangsterish feeling, and so you know we, I just loved him. Plus, he was the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. And he was extraordinarily safe because he was, you know, he kept boundaries. So when a guy looks like that, acts like that, and is also respectful and keeps boundaries, well, of course you fall in love with them. <laughs> the, I that, get it. I mean, Tim's like, <laughs> Pim's like, people fall in love with me all the time. No, no, no. no. But, you know, he's, I get yeah, it. No, no, I definitely see um, the appeal too. So this was your first feature film, right? And were you nervous about breaking into the world of film? Um, well, it was my first feature, but I had done a couple of small films like the Sackets at Universal, uh, you know, Coward of the County with, you know, Kenny Rogers. I had done a few little films. So um, I was not scared at all. And I think as I, I respected Jamie, I had met Jamie when we were under contract at Universal Studios and um, she and I were probably the last contract players there. So I met her one day in the hall and she just seemed like a really genuine, nice person. So, and Rick was a great person and the cast, I knew them all. So it wasn't scary at all. It was, it was, it was, good. It was yeah. Fun. So it was like a family. It was like a, like yeah. a family making a, and yeah. did you, because oh, I'm it, sorry, go ahead. It starts from the top down. Right. So, I mean, Rick was a great guy. So when you have somebody like that, who has your back, who literally has the back of everyone in there and is just trying to work together in a collaborative thing. It's like being a, it's like doing a play. It's a yeah. very different feeling than tacky things that can happen on shows. I've been blessed where I have not been on those shows, but I hear, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you go back and watch the original Halloween? And what did you think? So, so when he asked me to do it, I, I thought at the time, because I forgot about she and this other thing that I'd seen, I thought at the time, you know, I don't want to do horror. I just, I mean, I just don't want to. Can you imagine if my children see something like this when I grow up? So I was such a goody two shoes, right? So I go, no, I don't want to do horror. So I went back and I watched Halloween one and I sat there and I go, oh my God, this is the best horror film I've ever seen. Uh-huh. Yeah. Carpenter did the most amazing job of not having, you know, any gore, any horrific on-camera violence. And it was the scariest thing I'd ever seen. Um, so I just went, wow, this is a, you know, a, a, a trilogy or whatever that I want to be a part of. Right. And so that ended that for me. I was, I was on board all the way because of what the original had done. Yeah, no, that is great. I mean, uh, Halloween, the original, is my favorite movie of all time. It's just like you said, like I saw it when I was 11 and it everything from the music to the suspense to just the stalking to everything. It just it really resonated with me. The whole series I love, obviously. Um, but yeah, I definitely can see why people seeing that. And it just I mean, it, well, yeah, it kickstarted the whole slasher genre, but in such a like well done way so i can definitely see that um you know your character janet as you said is kind of like the good girl who who cares about laurie strode and and you know doesn't care much for leo rossi's character bud who's kind of more foul mouthed and stuff so we want to know between tim and i tim is more like the janet good girl type character and i'm sort of the foul mouth bud so what i want to know anna alicia in real life are you more of a janet or a bud <laughs> well it depends on the day but but I think that um, I have both in me and um, you know, I mean, my uh, I've gotten, you know, a lot freer as I have gotten um, on my own more and more. So I love freedom. I love the ability to express myself completely and fully as long as I respect other people's boundaries, Yes. but I don't want to, you know, uh, to repress myself. Uh, so I try to be respectful. In fact, I am respectful, but I am very, very free. I think when I was young, I was free internally. That's why I was so creative. I would create all of these things, but I lived in a much more, um, you know, repressive environment because of my uncles, my aunts, my Latino background, 
you know, we were raised to act a certain way, be a certain way. And I could do that easily. That's why I could play those roles. But there was another part of me that never got full expression. Um, and, and, you know, so now I have full expression and it's really kind of wonderful. And, and that's what I wish for everyone, really, you know, wow, as long as, as we're respectful of others and their boundaries, I think we should be free to express who we are. It's, it's, you know, people think you can't be free while socially conscious at the same time. You can, you just have to walk that line, right. Of always the respect for the other as you respect yourself. Exactly. Yeah. That is a great answer. And I yeah. tell Tim all the, all the time that I can say a few bad words here and there. And I say still no. Be respectful. <laughs> and Tim is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, <laughs> most of the movie takes place at night. Like, and I know that like horror movies that we, we hear like it messes, but yours is filmed inside a hospital. So like, was that filmed during the day? And did it, did it mess up like your sleep pattern? Like, how did you deal with the day to day of filming? Like, yeah, was it filmed mostly at night? Or not necessarily, right? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I, what I remember, and it's actually true of most productions, is they try to shoot as much as they can during the day, especially when, you, when you're inside, and they light it for night, right? It's lit for night. So they try to do that because of overtime. And uh, But there were a few nights that had, they had to be shot at night because they were exteriors, like when they're bringing Jamie in, you know, there's just certain things that had to be shot at night. So uh, I did some nights, but most of them I remember being during the day because it was an abandoned facility, right? So it wasn't like we had to get out. Uh, so, so that's, real patients are coming in. Yeah, right. in a hurry. We've got some real murders taking place. Right. But uh, yeah. So you, you, you guys, I'm sure have heard of the fact that I almost lost my eye during that production, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, we have a, one of our next questions, but we can jump to that right now is about your death scene. If you want to yeah. uh, talk about that. It's, no, it's can, my favorite oh, scene. We can, go, we can go in a row. We oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, in a, well, then I guess we'll get to the next part, which is very, very important. No, um, you know, we we're again with the extras of Halloween too. Um, you mentioned that you got to see uh, Leo Rossi naked in his <laughs> hospital bathtub scene, and we want to ask because we think you know too many people always f f focus on female nudity in films, and we want to talk more about the male nudity and um, was he actually really naked in that tub? Like he was fully naked in that tub, right? Well, I never, you know, ventured to peek around the, the, the rear shot of it. I can tell you from the rear shot of it, it looked like he was completely naked, but I was not facing the, so I don't know, but <laughs> From the rear end, he, he had a very nice rear end. <laughs> he had a very nice Yay! rear end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yes. Yeah, I'm, and I think that um, it's funny because I know that they always talk about that, like the tub was freezing cold and it's so funny, like, you know, secrets of acting because it looks incredibly yeah. warm. It like, looks like they're burning up. And, and things like that. But we, I yes. Do we, have to, I do have to say something in regards to that scene because the truth is I'm only remembering his butt from the movie. Oh, because we weren't allowed in that room. Oh, oh closed That's set. Very important for you guys to know that when there's nudity, only the gaffer or the lighting guy, sometimes not even the director, I mean, are actually in the room, oh. right? So that everyone feels comfortable and it's out of respect. So, no, in real life, I have never seen his behind. Uh, <laughs> no, that's actually good and respectful. And of course, we asked the question kind of in jest. It's just that, like I said, people focus so much on female nudity and stuff. And we're two uh, gay men who are going to ask about male nudity, you know? <laughs> so your your death scene is so like we love it's my favorite scene in the movie because it's so iconic because it's you are, like have Michael Myers come out of the dark right behind you. And but then and you mentioned in the DVD that like you're you fell to the ground, but one time you hit the uh, side and cut your eye. Is that right? Yeah. Tell us about that, because it's such a creepy scene. Like Tim was saying, I mean, it's it's such a creepy shot with his mask coming to light. It almost reminds me of the shot in the original when he comes to, you know, approaches Jamie Lee Curtis out of the darkness. It was so well done and it's so creepy. But then we heard this story that you like busted up your head while filming it. Oh, tell us about that. Stitches. 
Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I didn't understand how creepy it looked or felt because I was in it, right? I was in the front of it. And all I remember is that we had rehearsed it once and there was a mattress on the floor so that when he injected my eye, I would just collapse onto the mattress, right? Because when you get a, a hyperdermic needle in your eye, I guess you hit a certain artery or I don't really know the technicality of it, <laughs> but basically you're dead. And so you just collapse. So we rehearsed it and I just collapsed, everything went fine. So he comes in, he gives me this hypodermic needle and I collapse, right? Well, no one knew because no one, it, there had been a little bit of a miscommunication that the mattress had been moved a little bit and a desk had been moved closer. So as I collapse, right, I collapse into the corner of the desk, oh. full force into my, I forgot what I, I think it's this one. So yeah, I think it was this one. So my right eye. And so collapsed full force. And that's when I used a, not a nice word. I went, <laughs> oh, phew. and the next thing I said is, can you use it? Because I saw the blood coming out of my eye and, and Rick goes, you know, cut. And I go, don't cut, use it. And he said, you can't use it. He goes, he goes, you're not going to have bleeding eye during hypodermic plus We've got to get you to the hospital he goes, to save your eyes. So, so I was kind of really upset. They weren't using this incredible opportunity. So they rushed me to the hospital and I was the luckiest woman in the world because there happened to be a surgeon there okay. who had a good hand because I had 12 stitches. So literally he stitched me up and I had a little scar for a while, but very minimal compared to what it could have been. But this is the funniest part. So this is like the second day of shooting that this happens. So we have to shoot one of my biggest scenes in the cafeteria, like, you know, the next day or two days later, right? With my face completely swollen, black and blue. So they put all this white makeup on me to cover up all the black and blue. And, the, and Rick says, shoot her everything from this other angle. So if you see that scene, you're going to see me looking this way and everything is shot from one angle. Yeah. I never would have noticed. I, I, I haven't noticed at all. And that thinking of the scene, I know you are kind of sitting in a slant, but it looks so natural, you, you know? Look beautiful. Yeah, I, I'm... Wait, wait, I have to ask, was it surreal filming hospital stuff and then going right to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me think about it. You know, that's kind of my MO. I did a movie <laughs> called, um, you know, uh, the one where we're flying over uh, um, and I'm like the stewardess who saves everyone on the Aloha airline disaster. It's a true story. Mm. Um, I forgot the name of the film, but I did this film. And so I'm the hero. So I did two weeks of all of this very physical stuff going up and down all the roads, saving all the people, dragging them as I'm being bumped and everything, because, you know, the whole uh, fuselage just came off on that airplane. It's a true story. So wow. up in the air, this woman is saving everyone, right? And so they put in, pumped in all of this smoke into that scene. And as soon as it was over, I went straight to the hospital. I, I had Epstein bar for the next six months because I had so much bad shit going. And, and when I went in, the doctors looked at me and they go, are you a, an abused woman? I had black oh. and blue marks all over. They were going to report me as a battered wife. Oh, oh my God. God. And I said, no, it's my show. And I choose to do this <laughs> because I used to have to bump myself into the back of all the seats. Oh my wow. God. Wow. You're dedicated. I, know, I was going to say you are dedicated from kept falling into it. And then one tiny little thing for the hype, for the needle that goes in, was that just like a retractable needle, that kind of thing? I mean, that they used for it, obviously. Yeah, it, really, it, it really went into my eye. Yeah. No, wait, wait. Oh, okay. I was like, for a second, I'm like, I know that's a stupid question, but it's like, did it, you're like, actually, they really injected me every she time. Goes, it hurts every with, day. With saline. Oh, but this totally is so fun. weird. But tomorrow they're actually injecting into my eye because I have a stud inside my eye. Oh, wow. Okay, They're don't actually, watch Halloween 2 tonight. Then. I will not watch Halloween 2. You know, something we wanted to ask with you, you mentioned that you had met Jamie Lee Curtis before um, you guys filmed together. What was it like uh, working with her on this movie? Did you guys hang out at all? Um, and what was that wig like? <laughs> uh, well, um, Jamie's, Jamie's a beautiful woman. And, you know, so this wig was, you know, didn't to me, didn't do her justice because she's such a pretty woman. But, you know, I mean, that was what she had to do because to match up with, with the last show. But 
I always give people their space, particularly people that are recognizable because I want them to feel comfortable when they're working. Yeah. So when she was working, we said a nice hello. She remembered me. I remembered her. But we didn't have any scenes together other than you know maybe some quick stuff. So I did not get into her space. Um, that's just what I do as a rule of thumb, because I think, you know, we can't forget that even though it's fun, it is work. Yes. And also people deserve their, their space. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. No, it, that makes a lot of sense. Was, um, was John Carpenter on set at all? Because obviously he didn't direct this film, but he wrote it and produced and was so involved in everything. And, and with Rick Rosenthal, did he come on set a lot or did Deborah Hill? I believe either him or Deborah uh, re, uh, ended up directing one of the last scenes that we shot, which I think is the one with me and, and the walkie talkies. Yes. I think there was one day they came in just to do pickups. I don't know if Rick wasn't available. So I, I believe it was John. Um, I, I've met, I met him once and met Deborah as well, but I don't remember the context really. Um, I'm just a fan of his for that first Halloween one, because I really believe he did set the genre up in such a different way. And um, you know who else did that later was that uh, that that horror film where they all used cameras. It was the first time um, that Blair just, Witch Project. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. That was the next one to set the next stage. Right. Of, of how we would end up being able to get into those worlds. Yes. And then scream with the whole self-aware thing with horror, you know. Yes. And um, none of your scenes are with Donald Pleasance, but did you get to spend any time with Donald Pleasance? Yeah, did you meet him? I did meet him. He was a very nice man. Again, I didn't spend time with him. Um, you know, I just, I don't know why. I don't really go in there to make friends or to, you know. <laughs> I and a I job be, to do. I also don't want to be a fan. I get right? it. <laughs> I, 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 know, I was just going to say, oh, uh, we are. <laughs> right, but you you are not working alongside them. Yes, right? yes, exactly, I, don't want, exactly. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable that they have to deal with this actress who shows up every day. <gasps> oh my God, I <laughs> oh my saw God, one Donald. Halloween one. She's like, she's like Donald Pleasance. Can you please say I shot him six times over and over to me? <laughs> no, right. no so that totally makes sense. You make organic relationships, right? Yeah, ex Are exactly. Yeah. Okay. We're going to play just a quick little game with you where you, we give you a few quick true or false questions to see how well you know Halloween to 40 years later. Just a few, just a few. I know. <laughs> she's like, oh, really quick things. We'll see how you do. Um, Tim. Okay. True or false. SNL alumni Dana, Dana Carvey is in Halloween too. I take the fifth. <laughs> uh, you know, it is actually true. He is a, um, he works with a reporter who's um, going to the scene in Halloween. It's not the hospital scenes, but he had like this tiny role where he's working with one of the reporters. It's a crazy uh, cameo. Um, okay, you're, I think you're going to like this one. True or false? Your line of dialogue about Michael Myers being seen by your friend behind the Lost River Drive-In Movie Theater inspired a Halloween double feature event at the Mission Tiki Drive-In Theater in Montclair, California, where they rebranded the entire theater as the Lost River Drive-In. Wow, I had no idea. That is a, yes, I know. I actually put that in there because I really just wanted to tell you this. These people, and I wish I, I'll have to get their exact names, but they put on an event and they called it the Lost River Drive-In. And it shows a picture of you as Janet saying that, you know, to Bud, because, you know, your friend saw Michael Myers behind the Lost River Drive-In and they called the theater the Lost River Drive-In. They have like t-shirts and memorabilia. We'll have to tag them when they post this, but it's all based on Janet's line from that movie. You know, that is what's so cool about what we do, right? It's, yeah. it's that it really uh, sparks entertainment for people. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I think I think that's really great, actually. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, of course. Okay, true or false? Baywatch star Billy Warlock was in Halloween 2. Yes. Yes. Yay! There you go. We're doing a lot of, he had a small cameo because Dick Warlock, who played Michael Myers, who obviously you worked with, his son, he just comes in and he asks about his friend, Ben Tramer, who got run over and stuff. But yeah, Dick Warlock, I guess, um, worked both of them. And, and I've also heard great things about working with Dick Warlock, the stuntman who played Michael Myers. I mean, you obviously had, I heard he's very protective and very easy to work with. Is that was your experience? He's all of those things. He's a super nice man. I've seen him recently. I, I think I saw him like five years ago. Just a really warm, uh, you know, very, very, you know, 
uh, grateful man for the opportunity he's, he was given, you know, to be a part of this legacy. Yeah, no, no, totally. Um, I have, okay, one last one. And I think this one you will definitely get correct. True or false, Janet could not work that walkie talkie <laughs> for shit. For sure. It was like having an iPhone 10 now for me. <laughs> it is just amazing. I love your like, I don't know how to work this. You're turning all the knobs and everything. Oh, oh poor Janet. But anyway. Um, <laughs> um, when the movie was released, was there like a red carpet premiere? Was there a casting crew screening? And what was your thoughts when you first saw it? There was a, there was a screening for all of us who were involved in the film. And I went in there and this is what I'm saying. It's like, I have these two people in me. I went in there as this little goody good shoes. I thought, oh my goodness. It's like, I, I hope, I hope I can share this with my children when I have them one day. <laughs> and so I watched it and it was like, I was scared and all this stuff was going on. And I left and I thought, you know, Rick did such a good job. Everyone did such a good job, but I can never show these to my children. <laughs> and, and the most unbelievable thing is I have children, right? Like whatever, 15 years later. And then my children are like nine and seven or nine and 11. And I finally decide I'm going to tell them because I don't even know I'm an actress that I did this, right? So I, I turn it on and we watch it together and they're in and they look at me and they go, that's nothing, mom, because of course, in the new generation that they were a part of, that was like, that wasn't horrifying at all to them. I mean, yeah. they were a little upset when their mom got a needle in their eye. That was hard <laughs> for them to watch. <laughs> that is such a great story. They're like, I mean, but it, well, it brings us to our next question because when did you first become aware of all the fandom behind the Halloween series? Like, did you ever think this movie would become such a big part of your life even 40 years later? I never thought of it that way at all. I thought for me, it was a stepping stone forward, you know, generously offered by a director, a very generous director that I knew. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a, just a learning step for me. And, you know, I never, you know, when you're in the middle of things, you never, you know, really keep track. At least I don't keep track of things, right? I went from there. Then I did another film. I did Falcon Crest, right? I just kept working. So I never kept track. And it wasn't, and, you know, I walked away from everything in 1990 when I had my children. I just walked away. My mom was an invalid. So I walked away to care for my family and my mom. And it, it, was, it wasn't until I started to come back and I opened up a startup production company to mentor writers. And all of a sudden, my girlfriend of uh, the person that was working for me said, you need to open up a Facebook for your fans. And I didn't even realize it. So we opened up a Facebook and all of a sudden, all of these fans are like, 35 years old, I'm going, what were they doing watching me when they were, you know, five years old? And so I'm looking at all these and a large portion was horror sci-fi, right? It wasn't just Falcon Crest, a huge, the diehards were horror and sci-fi. Yeah. And so, you know, right now I'm creating a sci-fi horror series as I'm going back to work because oh. I want to tap into that those fans, I, I had no idea what a huge impact that film would make for that answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. no, that's definitely. And do you keep in ca uh, contact with any of the cast and crew? I mean, from Halloween yeah. team? I see them, right? Rick is a dear friend, his wife is a dear friend. And so when I go over to their home, I'll see Leo, right? I'll see Lance. You know, I've seen Gloria. I saw Gloria at the grocery store the other day. <laughs> so, uh, and then, uh, uh, the young the young woman who was in the tub with uh, Leo. Pamela Susan Shoup. Yeah, Pamela Susan Shoup. I saw her at, at an appointment I had like about two years ago. I saw her and her husband, uh, who is an ex-priest, which is interesting, and very, very, actually wonderful couple. And I found out they live down the street. So small world. wow, you need to have a Halloween two viewing party with everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it, it's pretty crazy. It is crazy. Have you um ever attended a horror convention or like a Halloween series convention? I never had until um uh like was it three or four years ago? I went to Dallas mm -hmm. and I attended the big one there. And we had a uh, all of us went out, like ten of us went out, and there's a question and answer thing. It was really cool. It was so cool. That's when I just realized I was very grateful for these people who who really, you know, they made me feel, um, you know, really uh, wonderful. I had no idea that I had impacted them. Like, oh, that. that's so cool. And as fans, and we say this a lot, like, you know, we um, 
love it when the people that were in these movies we love embrace them and really love them. And what we, we've heard from a lot of people we've interviewed is that they go to these conventions not really knowing what to expect, you know, thinking is this going to be awkward, weird, and then end up meeting like the sweetest, nicest people that are just very committed, you know, because it's just people like us, people that absolutely love these movies, love the people that were in them, you know, keep up with them throughout their careers. And yeah, so it's really cool. I mean, I think we'd love to see you at another convention at some time in the future. So hopefully maybe you'll give that a shot at yeah. some point. I yeah. was I was going to ask you a couple of Falcon Crest questions, if that's OK. Sure. <laughs> Uh, well, I just have two. Um, so you were very lucky and got to act with Lorenzo Lamas, who played Lance, and William R. Moses, who played Cole. Who do you prefer? <laughs> um, let me think. Uh, maybe I should pick David Selby. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, but between, you know what? I was the most uh, just the outrageously lucky woman. I mean, I remember going up to Warner Brothers and seeing, it was my first day on the set and looking up at these staircases that went into the huge a stage and there was Lorenzo standing out there. And I looked up and I thought, oh my God, that's going to be my husband. And then I remember walking on the set and then they had me in a car and Billy Moses comes up and it's my first scene with him. And I look up and I go, oh my God, that's going to be my husband. And, so, and I just thought, am I living a dream? So I had, I mean, I love men to begin with. But look at the men me I too. have. <laughs> <With right? me> <laughs> too. <laughs> exactly. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, men are the best. I don't, yes. So, so I had Lorenzo. I had Billy. I had David Selby. I had, you know, uh, Ken. Uh, was it Nolan? Who was Nolan? the priest? Yeah. I mean, I had, and I could name another ten gorgeous men, right? And and talented men that were part of my story. I, I mean, it was just like whoa. So, you know what? I could never pick. I, you know, okay. I, I, I had them all and they That's were all okay. Right. You're like, I'll take all of the above. <laughs> this is a silly question, but um, your cousin on the show, Robin, was played by Barbara Howard and she was uh, an alum of uh, the Friday 13 part for the final chapter. Did you ever talk about your, your horror history? We love setting up connections like that when people have worked with other people from horror movies. But yeah, had you guys, did you guys know that? Did you know she was in a Friday the 13th? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Do you I remember don't... Barbara Howard? <laughs> I, 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 re I remember, but I don't remember ever having a discussion you know, uh, anything to only do. we would. Only we would. We'd be like, you know, I died in Halloween too, and you died in Friday Thirteenth Part Four. Want to get nachos? <laughs> <laughs> I right. I just never thought of it quite that way because we were doing Falcon Crest. So <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Oh. If there's a reboot of Falcon Crest, would you be interested in doing it? Oh my God, I would want to be the driving force. Ooh. I have this unbelievable kind of Falcon Crest horror mix. Oh, can it take place on Halloween? <laughs> no, but it takes place when she comes back from the dead. Oh, yeah, because your your character was in a fire and then came back as Samantha, right? Yeah, so to me, you never saw her burnt alive, right? right? And then you saw her as Samantha. I think she was posing as Samantha. I think it was Melissa. So would I do a reboot? Yes, but I think she would be much more into the spiritual realm. So I think it would be a very interesting thing. Yes, I'm all for it. Let's like get charmed. it. Charmed. That's all. Sounds like charmed. Yeah, that's all. No, that's dark. Think of dark, dark charmed. Dark charm. <laughs> dark charm. The dark charm. No, that is awesome. You know, um, just a um, just a couple last questions. Like you were saying, what we'd love to know because you were saying that you were looking into doing like a horror sci-fi project. Can you tell us more about that? Because that sounds really cool. Well, I can't say too much because, you know, it's in the zeitgeist and you don't want, you know, the energy to go out. But I can tell you, oh, I'm going to share this with you. So I've always felt that I was indigenous, always. But, you know, I always had light, you know, very blonde hair when I was younger, very full face, very, you know, a more Spanish, Italian looking. And I kept saying to my mother, no, I feel like I'm Indian. Right. And so uh, fast forward to Ancestry. I find out I'm 18%. Oh. And not only that, but I come from a, a, a group of people, I think it's called the Hopala B2 people that actually crossed over the land bridge before it melted. Wow. So it's really, really cool. So I'm creating something that feeds into that DNA of mine, right? The more, um, I don't really want to say all the details, but that will go into 
uh, kind of like, you know, the end of the world aspect of it. How do we save it? And, you know, this kind of situation from a, from a folkloric, you know, Hispanic indigenous roots. So oh, it's cool. Wow. It's that's really, a great idea. It's, I think it's really great... cool. It's really cool. And, I'm going to the... let you guys know as soon as, as soon as it, you know, I'm really putting it out there because I'd love you to get it out there. Yes, yeah, we will definitely promote. Absolutely. That sounds really cool. I mean, that's the thing. And like the thing about like people who loved you in Halloween, like people like this will follow your career and support you all through it. So we're all for that. Yeah. And I also realized that there was a huge sci-fi following just because I did Battlestar and Buck Rogers. There's a oh my whole, gosh. Yeah. There's a whole other, you know, so wow. it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Sci-fi yeah. fans are just as dedicated. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a silly question, but, um, I, you know, when we were doing our research on you, you did an appearance on Arsenio Hall. And I was just wondering, I thought there was some real chemistry there. And I was just wondering your thoughts. Did he ever ask you out? Yeah. <laughs> no, he never asked me out, but we liked each other a lot. And we liked each other a lot because we like to play. Yeah, I can and, see it. And, and, and he, he wanted to play and I don't think he got to play with everybody. Right. And I, I like to play. I, you know, I grew up with brothers. So, you know, it, yes, it was chemistry, but it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't really sexual. It was more like teasing, like almost brothers do right about this and that. And then we played off of the chemistry because we thought that would be fun for the audience. Right. It was, I mean, you yeah. know, he's a gorgeous man and he's also a really nice man. So it was really easy to do that again. I felt safe. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, it's, it's, if you feel safe, you can play on all kinds of different energy totally, levels. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm a big fan of Arsenio's. He was super nice to me. I did a show twice, I think. Yeah. And each time I went on, he was just a, he was just a really, in my book, he was always very supportive. That's really cool. Yeah, it's nice to hear and that. funny too. No, and that's the thing. Yeah. He was funny. It was a, gr a great talk show. God, I remember, yeah, the, the talk show. He was so, so much energy, you know, it was just great. And very, very out there, very authentic, very yeah. uh, made, made his guests feel comfortable, right? And yet made it a good time for everybody. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So, so we have our one, our final question, and we ask this to everyone we interview, and it is a little bit pu um, putting you on the spot, but we're just going to um, do and see um, what your answer is. What is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on Halloween 2 that you've never told any other interviewer, podcast, convention, anything? It could be the smallest detail to earth shattering details or something, just anything as long as you've never told it to any any other interview or podcast or public or publication? <laughs> Does it have to be about the production itself? It could um, be anything. Anything real? No, something. No, I mean it could be adjacent. <laughs> I will tell you the most insane story that I've oh, ever love told it. anyone. <gasps> so <laughs> I can't go into all of the details, but um, I met a cast member, and I was single. He was single. And so he invited me to go flying one night in his plane. Wow. So I go to the Santa Monica airport to meet this man I do not know anything about other than the fact that he is a cast member and, and nice looking. Mm -hmm. So I don't know very many people. I'm kind of conservative. I'm kind of shy. So I thought, you know, it's time you have a date in Hollywood. Total so Janet. So, oh, Janet, right? So I go and I meet this, I, I go with this guy to the airplane and, you know, in the Santa Monica airport. And we go onto a little tiny plane that only two people fit in. We take off and I'm going, oh my God, are you out of your mind? You're flying with this guy you've never met. And he begins to do flips. Shut up. Oh. I can't. Oh my God. All over the sky. He did a loop de loop. We're doing loop de loops. <laughs> and and so we do all these dupe loop de loops. And I'm going, just have fun and pray you get back down. So we did all of this. We go back down and we land. And I lived to tell that story. Wow. wow. Wait a I've second. And I take it we're not going to get that cast member's name out of you today. I can't even remember his name. That's how much I knew him. Oh, wow. So he wasn't one of the main cast members. I think he had an important role for like a couple of days, 
but I don't remember. He was, you guys might remember because he was very good looking. Yeah. He was I mean, blonde, I'm thinking blonde, maybe the, the de- deputy hunt, the guy who plays oh, um, deputy hunt. That the might hunt. be him. Oh my God. That is. And I never saw him again. Wow. That's a good story. That is like one of, I will say one of the best stories we've gotten yeah. to that question. I mean, we've got some, we've gotten some juicy details from people, but that That's is like really great. One of the best stories. Wow. Yes, it was, it was what naivety and stupidity will get you. <laughs> but was it, it was, he kind of used the like, Hey, we're both going to be in Halloween too. Let's get together kind of thing. Uh, you know, he, he was flirtatious. I, you know, I was curious That's and, so and then he took it to the next level with the flying upside down in that plane. That is scary. Um, and that I is took cool. it to the level of when I was young, I used to pick up hitchhikers and I didn't die. That was a common so, thing though. Back then <laughs> hitchhiking was normal. So wow. I, I just think I was always like Mr. Magoo. They used to call me Mr. Magoo. I would like, just go walk around life. Just go come, come, come. And I was really lucky to meet nice people. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. At the end of the day, he knew how to fly the plane at the end of the day. <laughs> wow. I mean, that is a, that is a great, great story. Well, I, I just want to say thank you so much. We are so grateful that you yes. took the time to speak with us. We're such big fans. I mean, um, and we're so excited to see your next project. And, and again, we're, we're really appreciative that you took the time and that we could have you on our podcast, yeah, especially on your special Sunday. Yes, it was, you know, it is a special Sunday with my daughter getting engaged last night and having the brunch today. And she's an actress and she's wonderful. And you guys would go crazy over her. Can we so, congratulate her on yeah, air? What is her, what is her name? Her, name is, her professional name is Catherine Dillon. She's been on um, a lot of things that you would have seen in, in a couple of little films. And also she did... Um, you know, uh, well, you'll you'll look her up and you'll see all the stuff that she's done. And this not this new little horror short, I think, is is really going to do well because it's funny, it's scary, it's timely, it's it's really great. And that's uh, I, the the title that I gave you earlier on. So I can I can type it up and send it to you. Perfect. Yeah, Noche, I, know. I think it's called Noche de Infierno. And it's got a Latino element to it. It's an English album with a Latino element of, you know, sorority and what, you know, women do to get into sorority, but it's got a social message to it. That's pretty cool. And it's really funny. And it's, it's a little scary, but really funny. That's so awesome. awesome. Well, the one last thing before we go, do you mind if we take a quick screenshot pick with you on this? No, I don't mind. Okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> Let me fix my hair. Yeah. <laughs> Let's fix our hair. Before we take the picture, I just wanted to say it's really nice to meet the two of you. Oh, thank you so much. Are you a couple? Are you a couple? Um, No, we are good. Very good friends. We've been friends for probably 12 years. We bonded over our love for horror. And then we just started kind of talking about it and realizing, you know, maybe this could make a good podcast. And then we started reaching out to um, people in different horror movies and, and interviewing people. And now we've been doing it for almost a year. We've talked to like tons of people and we're just, it's been great. It's just been so much fun. Yeah, Matt has a boyfriend so if you know any gay friends for Tim, uh, Tim. I do know I do know but he's a little young for you so oh. I <laughs> oh well Tim is single and would appreciate any hookups I mean I connection, I'm connection. not giving you a hookup I will sorry you sorry sorry I meant hookup in the um, uh the nurse, in the Janet way of saying it of just uh, I'm so hanging out if we have boyfriends we don't have hookups yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it Matt did. I meant connect he has a boyfriend yes I, I do I do have a boyfriend so, okay but you know I find the chemistry between the two of you really nice you both are, are it's a really nice you know uh bad cop cop good cop kind of feeling to it oh thank, thank you. you no that is very very sweet of you and just so you know we're going to be releasing this in october big surprise for her halloween and so yeah and we're just so excited so are we ready for this screenshot yeah, yes. okay Yay. Yay! Perfect. Yes, thank you so much, Anna Lisa, for for taking the time today. Again, we will keep you posted on when the episode comes out, and we hope to stay in touch. And we're we're incredibly grateful. Yes, you're awesome. Well, my pleasure. It was really a nice way to end my Sunday. Thank you oh, so much. Perfect. Okay. Well, great. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll talk with you soon. Okay. Thank take you. care, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. 
This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall, who also hosts a great true crime podcast, Crime of Your Life. Please check out our website, happyhorrortime.com, where you can stream all of our episodes and see all our pretty little episode images. You can also follow our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you want to contact us about one of our recent episodes, send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash happyhorrortime. Patrons get access to our growing library of bonus episodes where we discuss older horror films, look back at popular franchises, and all kinds of other fun horror stuff. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. And we hope hope you have a happy horror time. time.